So up next, uh, fortunate to have Gary Bushko uh, join us to give a talk on his recent research. He's received his master's in chemistry at McMaster University um, under the supervision of uh, Russell Bell and Tom Nelson, who are pioneers in the field of ribonucleic acid synthetic biochemistry, followed by a doctoral degree in chemistry at the University of Manitoba with Frank Hruska, a pioneer in using NMR uh, spectroscopy to study nucleic acid sugar conformations. Gary didn't shy away from the postdoctoral experience, doing a couple of those. Um, and I, it, it seems as if he did that to really fill his tool belt with uh, really important techniques, including becoming a leader in the field of structural biology. He started the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory to work with Michael Kennedy as a, as a physical biochemist. Um, there he's moved up the ranks and uh, he was recently appointed the associate professor at the School of, of Molecular Biosciences at Washington State University. So he has now a joint appointment uh, with Washington State University and the PNNL. His lab is an important member and contributor to the Seattle Structural Genomics Center for Infectious Disease. It is a really impressive center that has solved the structure of over 1,600 proteins that are available as PDBs. Further, the center makes available um, over 8,000 expression clones and 4,000 purified proteins that the public can use. And again, uh, Gary has been a really important part of this. His research now is, uh, is focused on advancing our understanding of infectious diseases using structural genomics. And structural genomics is kind of an interesting term, um, I think, or a field. Um, it really is to solve structures of proteins that are mechanistically important in organisms that cause infectious disease. So finding the structure of proteins that are kind of the linchpins of these pathways for disease. Today, we'll be talking about uh, the key to brighter smiles and understanding biomineralization. Um, we're really excited to hear this talk, so take it away, Gary. Okay, thank you, John, for that introduction. Let's see if I can get this going without too many flaws. Uh, and... Can you hear us now, Angela? You're on mute now. I can hear and everything is fine. It's just yeah, needed to get okay. out and in again. So if there's any questions, we'll ask you at the end of this one. All right. Uh, Looks good, Gary. Okay, I'm good to go. And you can hear me, yep. I assume? Okay. Everything's good. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm Gary Butchko, and I was like, to say welcome from the, the desert part of the Pacific Northwest here in Richland, Washington. And today I'm going to talk about a different nuclei than uh, Angela spoke about, about. It's a little bit further down uh, the periodic table. It's uh, phosphorus. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you a small story uh, of success that we had working with, uh, with uh, Rick and company at, at Oregon State University. And, and that's where I'm going to start my talk. I'm going to start start by thanking everyone that's involved in this research. And foremost is, of course, Rick and Ryan at the Oregon State University. Uh, we approached them on this problem about, uh, I think, maybe 10 years ago. I think it was around the first, second generation of GCEs in, in this area with, with, with introducing uh, uh, phosphorylated amino acids into proteins. Uh, but then I noticed their third generation successes and I contacted uh, Ryan again and uh, they were great. They they made all the clones for me and sent them over and just told me what to do. And lo and behold, things worked. And that was amazing and fantastic because it's, it's allowing us to do some exciting sci science over here on this end in, in terms of the the, uh, the the proteins we were studying. And of course, I also like to thank people at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, specifically Wendy Shaw, who's been uh, the PI of... Uh, this biomineralization work uh, here at PNNL for the last 10, 15 years, uh, uh, maybe 15 years already. And, and Jean-Louis Tao, who's doing some uh, excellent spectroscopy as well, using the proteins that I've been feeding him. And with that, I'd like to also acknowledge who's been funding this program almost continuously for the past 15 years, and that's NIH, and in particular, the Institute of Dental and Cranial Focal Research. So what have we been doing for the past 15 years? Well, We've been looking at under, trying to understand how tooth enamel is formed. And for those of you who aren't aware, tooth enamel is about a one to two millimeter coating of, uh, of a mineral on the surface of our teeth. Uh, it's very important because once once we are born with the 
with, with our teeth, they're there forever. You destroy them, abuse them, well, that's going to be with you forever because there's no way that your body naturally uh, regenerates a dental enamel. And, and if you look at, at, at a more detailed level of what enamel is, well, it's essentially a droxyapatite that has been intricately woven into this, uh, into this uh, material that is very, very tough. You know, uh, tooth enamel is the toughest tissue in the human body. It's, ext it's extremely tough. And what we're interested in doing is, is understand at a molecular level uh, how, how, this, how this happens, how, how, how enamel is being formed. And, and like I said, we're going to understand the molecular mechanism. And if you look at, at a chemical equation, it looks pretty simple. It's just calcium and phosphate that's combined together to form a droxyapatite. But it's more so than that because it's intricately woven into this intricate pattern that makes it so strong. Uh, and of course, you know, the long range goal is what we want to do is, well, we're not going to be able to give you new teeth if we understand this mechanism. But what we're hoping to do is, is to develop therapies perhaps to, maybe we can be able to better repair or, or, or restore uh, uh, dental enamel if we are able to understand the molecular me mechanism and how enamel is being formed. So uh, uh, dental enamel is formed in these things called aminoblasts in inside our cells and they're, and they're done at a very early age. Uh, and the dominant protein in this milieu of, of uh, material is, is this protein called melogenin. It's about 90, over 95% of the protein at, at, the, at the start of enamel formation is melgenin. And, and here is the, uh, the amino acid sequence of, uh, of murine amalgenin. It's about 180 residues protein. I would say that throughout eukaryotes, this, this sequence is highly conserved, especially the important regions. Uh, and one thing to note uh, about this protein is that it contains 11 serine residues. And, uh, and the problem with that is that in nature, only one of these serine residues is phosphorylated, and that's serine 16. So while many people, us and other groups, have been working to understand the, how melgenin works, we've been producing melgenin recombinantly, and none of these, and, and the single serine has not been phosphorylated. And that's not too good because there's some evidence that phosphorylation is, plays a pretty important role. Phosphorylation of serine 16 plays a pretty important role in the, the molecular mechanism of, of producing enamel. So, uh, so uh, we wanted to get amalgenin that was phosphorylated at serine 16 specifically. And uh, this is just a, uh, uh, you know, a general uh, slide on how genetic code expansion works. I won't get into, into it in detail. You guys know more, much more about this than I do. But uh, the short story is that we, we we used genetic code expansion, but we wanted to in, 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 encode uh, phosphorylated uh, serine in a specific site in, in our proteins using this this protocol. Now, uh, I, I'm not going to go into too many details uh, of how how this was done, but I'm going to go into uh, things that, that at least I found more important, and that were the host, the E. coli host, and and if, if I understand how the genetic code expansion has evolved. In the second generation, a kind of a breakthrough was using these these ox serine oxytrophs, where you enabled when you when you locked out the ability of the E. coli to produce uh, the, the biochemical pathway to produce serine. Now, and that and the idea of doing that was so that you elevate the levels of of phosphoserine in, in your cells. Now, for animal spectroscopists, that's a problem because you cannot use minimal media to label your proteins. And as Angela had mentioned, enamel spectroscopists gen generally like to encode their proteins with uh, C-tryptin labeled carbon, N-15 labeled nitrogen, and, and, and in many cases, even deuterium as well. But uh, fortunately, there's a solution to that problem. It's a bit expensive, but you can buy, you can use isotopically labeled uh, algae, where essentially you have the, 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 the uh, you have your 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 serines that are that are already <coughs> excuse me uh, carbon and nitrogen labeled and, and and that proved to be these things have proved to work and what I've used and and Rick as well in, in their lab is we use uh, products from Celtone or from uh, or another product called BioExpress. But uh, but that didn't solve all the problems. There's still some issues and I believe the third generation did something different. 
they, they further uh, manipulated the E. coli hosts uh, to improve the yields of, of, of phosphorylated proteins. And I believe a, an important contribution was leading this thing called release factor one. And this is responsible for terminating transcription at amber cotons. Now, uh, this also, you know, wasn't only a, a good thing, it had some problems. And that was that, that sometimes uh, it would not put a phosphoserine in the correct place. And other amino acids would sometimes be substituted for phosphoserine. And the most uh, likely one was usually a glutamine. But the solution to this was, you know, just to give it a try and see what happens. And basically that's what we did over here. We just, uh, we could take the clones from Rick and Ryan and we, we, we seen how it works. And what we basically did, we experimented with uh, the expression conditions. Uh, and, and here's our table of some of the experiments we've done. And I just want to point out a few things. Uh, we were able, for, for instance, to use these uh, algae material from cell tone and bile express, they, and they were successful. And I might mention that there's an error in our table that was published. It's not milligrams per mil, which would be fantastic. It's milligrams per liter. But you can see where we're getting 10 to 15 uh, milligrams per liter of uh, our desired protein using these uh, commercially uh, labeled uh, media. Uh, another thing I would point out that at least in our hands for this protein, that you had to express it at uh, 37 degrees Celsius. If you went down to 25, and I just labeled, I just show uh, you know, one, one example here we're using auto reduction, you know, there was no labeled emulgin. So, so if nothing else, this, this, this illustrates that when you're using genetic code expansion, expansions to optimize things, you really got to work with with uh, with your conditions to, uh, to 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 get good results. Now, uh, the nuclei that 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 I that, I, that I'm going to base most of my talk on is uh, phosphorus and uh, phosphorus has 15 protons and like like fluorine, it has a spin of one half. It has a magnetic moment. It is very uh, it is a nice nice uh, NMR two. Uh, if you recall Angela's table, uh, protons and fluorine were about equally sensitive. You know, fluorine just a little bit uh, relative, relative, relative uh, to to uh, uh, protons of sensitivity, but relative to protons, phosphorus is about only fifteen percent as sensitive. So it's not as sensitive as fluorine in doing experiments, but it, it is uh, very. In, in another terms, it is sensitive to its chemical environment. And here you see, if you, you look at a, this is a nine-mer, single-stranded DNA nine-mer. And if you look at the phosphorus uh, spectra, you get uh, a chemical shift for almost every one of these uh, eight phos phosphate groups in, uh, in a small single strand of, of DNA. So, so it, it provides useful chemical shift information on its local environment. And, and that's uh, what, what we would like to use, one of the things we would like to use it for. So phosphorus NMR on imelginin. Well, let me... First of all, point out some of the properties of imelginin. It's an intrinsically disordered protein, and that's a good thing because it's happy in, in something that most people wouldn't put their proteins in, and that's 2% acetic acid. Uh, and it's also monomeric under these conditions. And uh, as you will see, this, this is, this is, this, when we're studying imelginin, this has been my go to system to, to see how uh, to characterize uh, manipulations that are made to the protein. And, and here is the, the, the first picture that was collected on our attempts to phosphorylate, to, to obtain uh, imelginin that's phosphorylated at the S16 position. And I, I, I might mention at this, this point that uh, at about the same time, uh, Rick and, and this group were also looking, look, trying to label proteins using, uh, using their system. And we both uh, uh, produce carbon and nitrogen laser labeled proteins at about the same time. And we published papers almost at the same time uh, using these two systems. But uh, I was surprised, you know, the first thing being an animal stroscopist, the first thing I did to see if we had the serine incorporated was to collect phosphorus NMR data. And as you can see here, that the, the NMR of, of just the amino acid of, of P serine, and, and when it's in, in, in the fuel like protein, there's almost the same. And one might expect that to be so because uh, it's a 2% acidic acids where it's uh, it's pretty well in a, in a random state. Now, the next NMR experiment we did to make sure it was uh, incorporated was uh, 
a proton uh, N15HS2C spectrum for melgenin. And, and this is maybe a poor choice of colors to overlay the two spectra, but, uh, but uh, in red is the spec HSQC spectrum for M179 that's unlabeled. And the blue one is, is one that contains phosphoserine. And for the most part, the, the cross peaks overlap, except for a few that happen to be near the serine. And of course, the biggest uh, chemical shift difference in the, in, the, in the spectrum in terms of the amides were for the phosphorylation at the, at the series 16. And this, this is the, shown here on this uh, graph where we plotted the differences between uh, you know, phosphorylated and non phosphorylated melgenin. And you can see that the major chemical shift difference in the amide was, of course, at, at series 16. And, and there was just local perturbations ar around the, uh, the, uh, this, this site. Now, we, we also tabulated the chemical shifts of the uh, serine uh, free in solution as an amino acid and in the in the proteins and of course as we as I mentioned before there was almost no shift in in the chemical shift for the for the phosphate however uh we did see some shifts in the c alpha protons uh and 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 the trend was the same whether it was the amino acid or in the proteins for the confirming that we had incorporated phosphoserine into our protein and the same was true for the C beta protons, and the shifts were in the opposite direction, where where the, where they were similar in you know the free amino acid and in in the whole protein. So that was I think altogether pretty good proof that we were successful in, in incorporating uh, our phosphoserine uh, in, in, into the protein. But because this world is now mass spectrometry centric. You have to, you have to, uh, you know, you know, you must spectroscopists aren't happy unless you give them a mixed spectrum to show you that you've succeeded. So this is just a some data collected by Moe Zell here at uh, PNNL, and you can see that the major product was indeed uh, M179 that was serine phosphorylated. They had the same expected expected molecular weights as we observed from the MZ uh, major cross peak. We also see some oxidation products, which was interesting, I thought. And we think these are oxidation of methionines in, in, in the protein. But what, what, what to note that we did see some uh, unphosphorylated M179 over here, suggesting that it, it in our solution anyways, uh, not all of it was phosphorylated. But the important thing to note that we didn't see any uh, M179 that could contain glutamic acid or any other amino acids. So to make a long story short, this suggested to us that any non-phosphorylated product wasn't due to misincorporation of natural amino acids into the, that amper codon. It was probably due to phosphatases in the E. coli that were slowly chopping up our, our, our removing the phosphate group of the serine at, at the 16th position. And so, so we were using the uh, B95 E. coli host was not giving us any trouble under the conditions we 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 adopted, uh, perhaps by luck. Now, now I believe what Rick and company does when the first thing when they're trying to see if they were successful in using in getting a, a phosphor protein is that they use these phosphate gels that contain this uh, chemical compound that that uh, that is really cool because it, it chelates uh, phosphate groups uh, in your protein. So the idea is that you you have this. This chemical inside your gel, and what it regards, what it does is that it, it binds uh, with, with 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 phosphorylated proteins, and it retards their pro, their elution on an SDS gel. So the more, and it's also uh, reduces it on the basis of how many phosphate groups that your protein has. So uh, so we eventually did, did this as well, and you can see that uh, uh, native one M one seventy nine moves more faster on the gel than the phosphorylated products. And this is just a, a gel where we've got used various media to label our proteins. And you can see that we've got, we've got a little bit of, of, of non-phosphorylated proteins in some of, under some of these conditions. Uh, uh, but for the most part, our, our, we've got about, nine, most, we're able to, in the end, get about 90 to 95% of our samples that are containing uh, phosphorylated serine at the at the 16th position, but uh, but as I mentioned, the yields were not 100 percent, 
as shown by these uh, phospho, phospho gels, but you can, and I'll just make note for people trying to do this, that we also try to purify it using uh, phosphate agrose columns. And there's other columns that you can purchase out there that have different kinds of chemistries. We tried these columns as well to try and get the yield to 100%. None of them worked. And, and I think in the very end, uh, what I think is was most important was that the length of, of time that we're after induction before harvesting the cells. Uh, and you could just see here that we also were able to deuterate our proteins by, by growing things in, in, deuter in deuterated water and deuterated media. And you can see that we get, we get more, these things are slow. When you deuterate in E. coli, it takes a lot, 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 lot longer because the cells are just happy. So, so here we, we were, because we were inducing for a longer period of time, we had, we had more non-phosphorylated product. And I think this was because it, the phosphatases inside the cells were just chewing it up over time. So, so now that we've got this protein, we did some work to try to uh, understand some of the biophysics and what was happening. Uh, and I'll just go through a, a, a few things that we did with this protein uh, uh, in the last few months. And one of the things, uh, part of the properties of imelgenin is that it self-assembles as you increase the pH. And this is just a bunch of HSQC spectra that uh, kind of show this. This, this as uh, and for animal source hospice, you see that as you increase the pH, you lose uh, amide cross peaks, and the spectra become and the cross peaks become broader. And this is telling you right off the hat, right off the bat, that that aggregation is occurring. And people have used other techniques to show that as amelgenin goes from about oligomers at about pH just under seven uh, to these large complexes called nanospheres at uh, a pH over seven. And here's just a cartoon representations of these structures. Uh, these oligomers are believed to be between contain four to eight uh, 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 monomeric units. And these oligomer and these nanospheres contain about 20 to 40 uh, uh, in the individual molecules of amelgenin. And what we we did is we followed this this uh, self aggregation self assembly using phosphorus NMR, and at low pH we seen one sharp peak, which uh, at roughly two uh, roughly uh, one ppm or was zero point seven to be exact. Now as we increase the, the pH and and uh, collect the spectra into the regime where oligomers were forming, you can see that uh, we seen a broad peak appear and it had shifted. So that told us right away that Yes, oligomers were forming, and that the, its chemical environment were 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 being perturbed because, uh, and, and according to this model, where the phosphorylene is located at the end terminal of the protein, the 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 phosphorus the phosphorylene serine was kind of we, we believe kind of exposed at the surface of, the, of, of uh, more exposed at the surface of these small oligomeric complexes. However, when you go to nanospheres. We don't see any evidence for uh, for the for the for uh, for, for phosphorus in, when we collect the NMR spectra, and this is because this this adheres to models of nanospheres formation, where the N terminate are buried inside these nanospheres, and 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 these environments not only are they heterogeneous, but these phosphoruses are experiencing a huge molecular weight complex. These things are in the hundreds of kilodaltons of size. So they are invisible uh, in, our, in our phosphorus spectrum as one would expect. Now, the other things that we quickly be able to show is that nanospheres are believed to be in equilibrium between uh, these nanosphere structures and monomers and oligomers. And what is believed to be happening, one, one, one model is that these nanospheres aren't themselves responsible for uh, are orchestrating the uh, the formation of hydroxyapatite with these long rods, but it's, it's more more likely that it is a source of of small monomers and maybe oligomers of amelgenin that adhere to hydroxyapatite initial hydroxyapatite that 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 initially is starting to crystallize, and we kind of indirectly shown that that this is correct as well as other people have shown, and this was shown by adding uh, lambda phosphatase to these solutions of pH 7.5 where nanospores exist. And what we observed is that the lambda phosphatase was able to remove the phosphate groups from, from uh, at serine 16 position. So that was indicating that, you know, the, the, these uh, N-termini were not always buried inside the centers of these nanospheres. They were free of being exposed 
uh, momentarily and exposed enough that uh, uh, lambda phosphatase was able to remove the phosphate groups uh, from 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 the from the monomers. So so, anyways, all this was published uh, just recently in uh, in Protein Science, and you can uh, look at this paper to get more details uh, of what what we did. And 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 I say we're really. It, uh, I'm excited and people in the biomineralization uh, people are excited because enamel is just one example of of the of the many important biomineralizations that occurs in nature. Uh, you know, it's anything from eggshells to our, our bones uh, to coral and to diatoms in the ocean. And uh, in these types of biomineralization processes, we're not just having calcium and phosphate interacting. There's lots more calcium and carbonate that are interacting to form these structures. And this is very important because this involves carbon, di ca uh, carbon dioxide. And we all know that uh, carbon dioxide is a very hot topic nowadays. So, so the idea is if we can understand these mechanisms and we're smart, we might be able to use some of these uh, mechanisms that nature has evolved to maybe uh, develop new ways of sequestering carbon dioxide storing it in a solid form by some ways until we get ourselves off this uh, fossil fuel habit of, of, of ours. So, so anyways, uh, there are many, there are many, like say, uh, biomineralization proteins. And one of the common denominator of many of these proteins that orchestrate the, the produce, production of these biominerals are, are actually phosphorylated proteins. So there's, we, we are interested, in, and I'm sure other people are interested in being able to use genetic code expansion to actually generate these phosphoproteins as well. So, and these will help us understand how these, these mechanisms are, are also working. So, so in the end, you know, what, what we hope that I've done in this last 20, 25 minutes is demonstrated that understanding biomodernization is indeed the key, not only to brighter smiles, but maybe for many other reasons and, and maybe getting, a, you know, a, uh, some insights on how we can combat global warming as well. So everything we do maybe has, ex, you know, uh, 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 ap applications for to solve problems that we don't directly see. So, so, anyways, that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions, you can ask me now, or you know, of course, email 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 mail me at the uh, email just below. So, anyways, thank you for your time, and uh, I'll hand it over back to our host here. Got it.